Amen. <clears throat> All right, back to the Revelation. And uh, we're going to go to chapter 12. Revelation chapter number 12. Just uh, to speak on the bright side for a second, we are uh, right at the halfway to a little past halfway point in, uh, in the Revelation. Whether that's good, bad, or otherwise, I guess you can determine that. It's a great study, especially doing it verse by verse like we are. But I do feel like that we're going to need to follow this up with uh, the book of Daniel. Uh, there'll be a little bit of a of a um, intermission there as as Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their lives and how they were uh, a part of the uh, uh, servants of uh, Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar before we get back into prophecy things that Daniel has much to say about. But, uh, but I kind of feel like that's the direction we're going to be going on Wednesday nights and because starting in May... Um, we will begin a sermon series um, verse by verse through Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. And uh, um, just this has been on my heart for quite some time, and if it's been on my heart this long, I know that the Lord knows we need this. And uh, those three chapters, along with John... 13, 14, 15, and 16 might be the seven most important chapters in all the Gospels. And so uh, we are going to tackle those uh, beginning in May, probably shoot that all the way through most of the summer, and uh, uh, maybe try to end it right around the time we do our next uh, uh, Sunday night Bible study, which would be a, a, winter, a summer Bible study this time around. I know, let's not talk about summer just yet, right? But uh, that's the way I think. See, for me, it's already like August in, in my mind uh, with a lot of just things that you always look ahead to. I'll be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why I need vacation every now and then because I, I, that my mind is going constantly uh, shooting ahead, especially with regards to messages. Um, whether, whether you ever really think about this or not, um, you know, I, I and, and this is just the way things go, uh, Thursdays are really the only day that I can kind of rest mentally a little bit because Friday and Saturday is all about getting ready for Sunday. Um, Monday is kind of just the rest day, but I'm already thinking about the Wednesday night message and if I know what I'm preaching on Sunday, that's already on my mind as well. In the middle of that, got to do a Sunday school lesson and all those things. So it's just kind of a concept. It just comes at me fast. And so if I, if I get a little bit or feel like I'm a little bit behind, I start panicking. And then I'm just a miserable person to be around. Because who is fun to be around when they're panicky all the time? But, um, but anyway, that's uh, where we are. So it's really good that, that we've got some good direction on Wednesday nights. That takes a lot of pressure off. Because I know every Wednesday I just focus the whole day on getting ready for tonight and, uh, and write a bulletin article in there as well. So uh, Revelation begins for us to set the scene for the second coming of Jesus. Okay, we are now on the fast track to the glorious appearing as it's called. From the previous messages we note that we finally get or got a timetable it reveals to us a final 1260 days or three and a half years which uh, we have seen the first part already of that 1260 days or three and a half years of the fulfilling of Daniel's 70th week which is highlighted or depicted in Daniel chapter 9 Daniel's 70th week goes like this. There's one day for each year, which equals then seven years. And we are in the pause of those 70th weeks because 69 of those weeks have been fulfilled. 
and then the pause button has allowed for the church age to happen, which I think we would all agree, especially if you read 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, that the church is in the falling away stage, that there is an apostasy that is, is going on worldwide, but especially uh, we see it in our nation for sure. And uh, with that falling away, getting ready then for the rapture, which ushers in the seven years of tribulation when the pause button is taken off. Um, it, uh, the, this then only sets the stage for the final act, which is where we are in Revelation. Is this an act that begins with, as described in Revelation 12, an intergalactic conflict? I mean, this, I mean, you could do sci fi stuff with this real easy, for sure. So we're going to tackle this chapter uh, just a few verses at a time, only looking at the first eight for this message. Let's look at verses one and two. And there appeared a great woman, or excuse me, there appeared a great wonder. The woman's coming up. I was already thinking about that. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. There's a lot there, even though it's just two verses. So let's go fairly slowly as we talk about and we open up our fill in the blank portion from rejection to repentance. And what we're seeing in verses one and two is from rejection to repentance. So the word wonder, and there appeared a great wonder in heaven, can also be uh, said a sign. There was a great sign in heaven. It is then a symbol that's pointing to something else. Okay? It's, it's John getting a, 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 a picture show. And so leading into this particular chapter, I read ahead and I was just kind of thinking about it for the, for the past few days, and I wondered why. Why doesn't God, through inspiring the Holy Spirit to write the Bible through now the person of John, why doesn't he just write, this is what this is? rather than giving us wonders or signs that are pointing to something else why all the mystery do you ever wonder that especially with the revelation now those two things that the devil unleashed out of the bottomless pit y'all remember that there was the scorpion like things and then there was the horseman that had all kinds of just crazy stuff going on with them the the scorpion creatures tormented for several months and then it was the horseman that actually killed a third of the population that's not so far-fetched to think about because john is just using what he can to describe what he's seeing you know with a pen and paper um and and so well maybe not a pen and paper but you get you get what i'm saying um and and so that's not so difficult to understand but why why are we talking so uh, it's such in a cloudy fashion when we're talking about signs and wonders and 12 stars and all this kind of stuff. Why don't we just come out and say what we say? I'm not real sure other than to know this. This is where my several days of thinking about this where I came to a conclusion that God always wants us to study his word. Okay? In fact, uh, Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, told Timothy to study to show yourself approved. 
And so we need to study God's Word. That means we need to get into God's Word. That means we need to know that we need some help studying God's Word. The Holy Spirit's our teacher. So we need to learn how to activate the Holy Spirit when we're reading God's Word. Holy Spirit, help me to understand this. Help me to see what's going on. Help me to understand what these symbols mean. And then the last thing would be that I was thinking of was, remember when Jesus spoke in parables? And what did he say on many occasions after he spoke in parables? He said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. And what's that mean? It means that those people that are really tuned in hear what I'm saying. Those people that are not really paying real close attention are not taking my words very seriously. It's just going to be in one ear, out the other. And so maybe those are some of the reasons why there's just such a, a mysterious vibe, even in the first two verses of chapter 12. But what we are actually seeing is uh, uh, some amazing things. The symbol of the woman points to the nation of Israel. Okay? So that's where we start filling in some blanks. The symbol of the woman points us directly to Israel. The woman clothed in the sun, the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of how many stars? Twelve. So the crown of twelve stars represents Israel's twelve tribes. She is uh, being clothed with the sun, signifies her glory, dignity, and exalted status. Israel, by the way, is and always will be God's people of promise who ultimately will be saved and given a kingdom. So that's where we are heading in these final three and a half years with this mysterious picture that is unfolding beginning in chapter 12 verse 1 the moon under her feet might point to god's covenant relationship with them since new moons were associated with their times of worship did you know that there was one of the priests that his only job his only job was to blow the trumpet every time there was a new moon that's that's his only job so I can just imagine, you know, Israel's a pretty mountainous kind of region. There's real good mountains, and then there's vast valleys, and they farm the valleys, and they live in the mountains is the way they do, even to this day. And so up on the top of the mountain, there's this guy sitting there, and he watches the moon come up. The moon come up, the moon come up, the moon come up, 30 days. And then all of a sudden, there's no moon. He goes, he's got to find his trumpet because he's lost it after 29 days. And then after 29 days, he's got to blow his trumpet. So, so I'm sure that went on. Okay, let's, let's just say that this priest was smarter than your average Joe. That he's counting the days. He goes, well, that happened 30 days, and then 30 days, and then uh, probably three months. Okay, let's give him three months. That he realized, I can go play golf for 29 days. Because my only job is on the 30th day when the new moon comes up, or doesn't come up. And then I just blow my trumpet. And you know what? Every new month set apart then new worship at the, at the temple. So it was kind of a way to start the month focusing on Jesus all over again. Pretty cool deal. That was a great gig, by the way, for that guy. I don't know who it was, but he, he got the good end of the stick other than some of those other guys who, you know, they had to put the garb all over him and the tassel around the bottom we were talking about this at lunch today the tassel around the bottom of his robe uh, that had bells hooked up to it and they would put a rope around his foot and when he went into the holy of holies if he sinned and the bells quit ringing they'd just drag him out because he'd be dead that's not a good gig by the way uh, that was that'd be kind of scary but uh, so we're talking about israel and and uh, the moon the new moons probably associated with their worship. Now let me just say this. 
verse 2, she being with child cried, travailing in birth. Okay, so verse 2 actually starts out in the present tense, doesn't it? She being with child. So Israel has known really since God's choosing them as his people nothing but trouble I read this and I thought it'd be good to read to you uh, I don't know who Herman Hoyt is maybe you do he's got doctor beside his name like Denise now no I'm just kidding she doesn't but uh, the activity of the woman from the time of Abraham to the birth of Christ is described in verse 2 the present tense of the verses provides a dramatic setting. The woman is continuously with child. She is continually crying in the pain of travail. She is continuously experiencing labor to be delivered. Herein, then, are pictured the experiences of Israel as a nation from the moment she was brought into existence with the call of Abraham until the day Christ was born in Bethlehem. And I think we could also conclude that even now Israel is still in Satan's scope. So we know then, always front and center in Satan's scope, Israel suffers. Even as recently as the 1920s and 30s, especially into the 30s and into the 40s with Hitler, um, Israel has always been right in Satan's scope. Then, because of this, they travail and are pained to be delivered. Now, if you have ever been around a woman, your wife, or someone, ladies that have given birth, you know that is the most traumatic thing you can experience. Some people have compared it to having a kidney stone. Thank the Lord, I have not known either. But uh, especially thank the Lord, I've never had a baby. Because I was with Kim all three times. And... Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm just glad I live to tell about it. Being that close. You know, as a woman labors to give birth, they are in the pain to be delivered. And from that pain, through the relief that comes through giving birth. And what this verse is beginning to let us see is that there's an end in sight. There's hope on the horizon for Israel. The focus then being put back on Israel here shows us that a change, a longing, a searching is happening in God's people. They are beginning to turn back to God. And by the way, we shouldn't be surprised by this moving back to God. I mean, after all, they have... 144,000 witnesses out there with the power of God on their lives and they've got these really strange two men hanging out in Jerusalem witnessing and telling them what's going on and they're not shy about it so through this travail and their witness the Bible's telling us here that, that many Jews are going to be saved during the seven-year tribulation, but especially leading up to the appearing of Christ or the second coming of Christ, which, is, which happens at the end of seven years, the end of this three and a half years for sure. So of note, just as the first coming of Jesus centered on the Jews, so will his second coming as many Jews go from rejecting Christ to repenting and coming to Christ as Savior. 
And you know that has not been the case for the majority of the church age. Maybe the first 25 to 50 years of the church age, there was a pretty large amount of Jews that got saved. But after that, mostly Gentiles have been saved throughout history. So uh, I was reading another commentary. This happened to be Tony Evans's commentary, and, and he says this, her pregnancy denotes two realities. First, it symbolizes the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, came through Israel. At his first coming, Jesus was born of a Jewish woman. Second, it symbolizes the fact that Jesus' second coming must again originate with Israel. Um, the purpose of the tribulation is for Israel to give birth, so to speak, to the Messiah once again. In other words, Jesus cannot return until Israel receives him. Most of the Jewish people currently reject him, yet through the labor and agony that's mentioned here in verse 2 of the tribulation, overwhelming numbers of Israelites will receive Christ. Only after that occurs can he appear to the rest of the world. So, verses 1 and 2 show a rejection or to repentance situation for the Jew. Next up, verses 3 through 8 show us Satan's rebellion, which leads to repulsive behavior. Satan's rebellion, which leads to repulsive behavior. We might not get much into the repulsive behavior part in tonight's message, but you'll see some pretty crazy things in these next few verses for sure. Let's read verse 3. There appeared another woman, or excuse me, man, another wonder. Another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his heads. His tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. She brought forth a man-child, who was to do what? Rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child, instead of being devoured, by this dragon was caught up unto God and to his throne. The woman fled into the wilderness where she had a place prepared of God that they should feed her, how many? 1260 days. 1,203 score days. Let's stop right there for just a second. So the woman's uh, Israel's enemy is this dragon, also known as Satan. And by the way, just so you know, he is called from this point forward a dragon 13 more times in the Revelation. His color, color was he? Red. Um stands for or depicts the bloodshed he authors on the earth. Seven heads, which is a continuation of, again, the prophecy of Daniel. So Daniel links right into the Revelation and the seven heads show his domination of six previous kingdoms. Okay? Those six kingdoms. Can you name them? I, I worked a lot this morning on, on figuring this one out. 
because I could get six real quick. Okay, Egypt, Assyria. Remember, Assyria was who took care of Israel, the northern kingdom. Sennacherib was the king. Rabshakeh was the scribe that came down, all that kind of stuff. Assyria. Oh, by the way, that's also where Nineveh was, where Jonah was sent to be a missionary. Uh, the capital city of Assyria was Nineveh. So you've got Egypt and the Pharaoh. Okay, The Pharaoh wasn't very nice to the Jews, was he? The one that didn't know Joseph anyway. Uh, wasn't, wasn't very nice, but what did God do to him? You know, he showed him who was boss. But you got Satan working through the Pharaoh, ultimately working through Egypt. Then you got Assyria and Sennacherib and Rabshakeh, and that fig figures into Hezekiah's kingship in, in Judah. The third kingdom, who overcame Assyria? Do you remember? Not yet. You're forgetting one. Daniel. Remember Daniel. Babylon. Babylon and Nebuchadnezzar, right? Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was uh, not a real nice guy, was he? Uh, God kind of got a hold of him too, turned him into a, a beast for either seven days or seven years. We're just not real sure. Either way, that would have been a freaky moment. Um, but uh, you got Babylon. Babylon was also the one who, the nation who came in and overcame Judah, tore down the temple, burned Jerusalem, okay, and scattered the people. Fourth nation, nation that overcame Babylon was now Media Persia, Media Persian Empire. And uh, that's who was the ruling world uh, when Haman came on the scene, the book of Esther. And boy, Haman hated the Jews, didn't he? I mean, we're talking about devil. I mean, the devil, Haman might mean Satan in the, in the Greek or the Hebrew or some language because that guy was mean. He was ugly. So that's your fourth. The fifth, who overcame the media Persian Empire, was Alexander the Great, the Greeks. Okay? And uh, the Greeks, that didn't last very long because Alexander the Great got really bored with life and died of hedonism and, and uh, so split the kingdom into a few under his generals and all that, and they became a lot weaker. And then all of a sudden you've got, bam, whammo, number six, Rome comes in. And the Roman Empire takes over uh, during the 400 years of silence, okay? And so the Roman Empire is in charge in Jesus' day. In fact, through most of the rest, if not all the rest of the New Testament, the Romans are in charge. Well, interestingly enough, again, that only brings us to six, okay? But interestingly enough, the Roman Empire never really was defeated, and you can go through history and you can find for yourself that, that Rome really never, nobody ever really came in and just defeated Rome and took care of business. What they essentially did was they just kind of faded out. Well, guess what the Antichrist is going to do? Guess what Satan is going to do? He's going to revive the Roman Empire and he's going to bring it back into a uh, power, world or the world power, He's going to utilize what Rome had back then once again, and that becomes the seventh head. Okay? So that's why he's got seven heads. This then will be the seventh head is yet to be, again, the revived Roman Empire. And this will be the uniting of the ten European nations. That's why the Bible says in verse 3 that he's got seven heads and ten horns. Again, I ask the question just like you do. Why doesn't the Bible just say this is the revived Roman Empire? But kind of got to dig it out a little bit. You got to study it through. And if, you, if your Bible is a reference Bible, you're going to see in those references, references all down through there back to Daniel. Because Daniel talks about the very same thing. Um, by the way, these nations led by Satan have always attempted to rid the world of God's people. Always. Can you think of a few times? How about all the male babies under Pharaoh? What were they supposed to be? Killed. Right? 
That's why Moses was such a miracle. How about uh, when Babylon came in? Babylon came in and ran roughshod over all the Jews. Again, we hearken back to Haman. Haman wanted to expel all the Jews. That was probably the closest Old Testament account past Moses of, of Satan almost getting his way. I mean, that was, that was pretty close. We were talking about like nine months away. Um, how about when Jesus was born? What did uh, Herod want to do? He wanted to kill all the babies. Was it two and under? Right? Which means... That tells us actually that the uh, wise guys probably didn't get over to uh, Bethlehem till about two years after Jesus' birth. Yet they were still living in Bethlehem and they were about out of money, so those wise guys had some gifts and provided for Jesus, Joseph, and Mary to get to Egypt for a while. And then G God told them to come on back up to uh, Israel after Herod the Great died. So there's just a continuation of seeing how that Satan always wants to get rid of God's people. Why is this, do you think? Why is this? Because they are led by the great red dragon. You see, Satan knows if he can rid the world of God's people, he actually becomes God. Do you, do you realize that? God's world revolves around the promises he gave to his people. If Satan could have destroyed the Jews under Haman with the okay of Ahasuerus and Esther, then there wouldn't have been a Messiah. You see that? Because Jesus had to be Jewish. He had to fulfill the promise that was made with Adam and Eve, confirmed with Abraham, talked about by Moses, all the way through. You see, Satan's, Satan knows what he's doing here, trying to get rid of the Jews. Yet, thankfully, we know that God's word prevails over all. Because we know the Bible says, and it cannot lie, God cannot lie when he tells us that the word of God will be preserved forever. So it prevails over all, and God's word shows uh, of Satan's fall, his evil schemes, and his ultimate destruction. Verse 4 actually tells of his demons that fell in the rebellion. Okay? Uh the dragon's tail drew a third part of the stars of heaven. Those would be the, the, the angels that fell with Satan. Stars, we've already uh, seen a synonym with an angel previous here in Revelation. He did cast them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. God's protection of his people is promised. Verse 5, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. Rather than be devoured by the dragon, her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. God protected Jesus all the way until he ascended right back up into heaven to be on the right hand of God. The woman, what about Israel, fled into the wilderness, verse 6 says. And... Uh, she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her for 1260 days. Uh, God's protection of his people is promised in those verses. That's where, by the way, most people believe that uh, that place of protection will be Petra. That's where most people believe that will happen. And as I told you a few weeks ago, if you want to see Petra, Watch the end of the third Indiana Jones movie. That's where it was filmed. It was filmed uh, at, the, at uh, what we think is Petra. Um, pretty, pretty cool. So then depicting the birth of Jesus and all that is comes from verse 5. Through him, of course, we know 
and have our salvation. Through him, Israel will know then salvation and protection during these last three and a half years before Jesus comes to do what? Rule with the rod of iron, which is what uh, verse 5 says he will do. So let's just get into this just briefly, and then we'll finish up. From verse 7, then, there was war in heaven, or in the heavens. Interestingly enough, we're just off of our winter Bible study, which talks about where our battle lies. Remember, it lies in heavenly places. It's, it's in the unseen world. There was an unseen battle in heaven or in the heavens. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon fought and his angels, but they prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven, thankfully, for the devil and his demons. So from verse 7, we see this intergalactic conflict also included heaven's angels versus Satan and his following demons. The winner is declared in verse 8, and thankfully that's no surprise. Yet, this does not detour Satan from still attempting to overcome. Because you see, he still seeks to become God and still seeks to destroy the lives of humans, particularly God's people. Okay, that's why chapter 12's focus is the Jew, because the Jews will turn from rejection to repentance and lead in or usher in the ultimate second coming of Christ. Okay? So that's where this the jew integration into revelation is so vitally important to everything we can't be lured through the devil's uh, evil schemes and must remain motivated to speak the truth about jesus our ultimate victor so though satan still seeks to be god we cannot be lured into any of his evil schemes Let's remain motivated to speak the truth about Jesus. And I suppose we could carry this one step further and say that from chapter 12 forward, the focus now lying squarely on the Jews with regards to evangelism is just that much more reason as Gentiles to be motivated today to save some even though, as Jude says, they might smell like the fire. So, time is short. And I think chapters like this motivate us as a church, or should, to get some friends here on Friend Day, to witness to our friends, to talk to our friends about not just church, but about Jesus. Because He is the only one who can save. So, let me just ask you a dangerous question. Does this make sense? We, we kind of like trying to figure this, because this is, i got to be honest with you, this is wild stuff. Okay, that's why I prefaced it by saying a sci-fi movie could be made out of this. But it's, it's coming, and uh, we'll study more next week. Lord, we thank you for our time together tonight. And as the title of this entire work through Revelation, it is closer than we think. Or we could be right on the doorstep of never having another opportunity to witness to a friend, a neighbor, a son, a daughter, Please open up doors 
and as you do provide opportunities, help us to take advantage of those opportunities and be a voice. Lord, it's up to you to provide the increase. We know that, but you are looking to us to speak As you give us those opportunities, give us the boldness to do that. In Jesus' name, amen.